as you all know, I guess you're here for the primer session. This is a new session we are trying out this year. It's to provide some background on all of the sessions that will be held today. So you're gonna get a brief introduction on all of the technology that is gonna be covered in the sessions later on today. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to introduce the chair and then she's going to bring up all the presenters one by one. Um, so today our chair of this session is Jacqueline Pitlars. She's a staff researcher at Dolby Laboratories and, a, and an expert on HDR. Please give her a round of applause. Thank you very much. So I'm gonna make this pretty short and sweet. We're gonna go through 15 or 20 minute presentations. There's gonna be no Q&A um, because we just don't have time to get all the information that we wanna tell you in that short amount of time. So at the very end, there's a coffee break, so feel free to ask the presenters whatever you want, and we're gonna keep this short and quick. So Ben, you wanna come on up? Thanks, guys. I am Ben Wagoner, and we're gonna talk about the basics of compression here. So, um, so this, I realized I compressed my first digital media file 30 years ago next month. So I'm gonna try to compress 30 years into 15 minutes. That's 30 seconds a year. So some of those are boring. Um, the idea is to talk about some of the fundamentals of compression and I'm just gonna get some of the very high level things which really have an impact on what makes compression good or bad. Um, and efficient, all that kind of stuff. And then, because there's so many codex and distribution arguments and papers that have numbers that are uh, interesting yet do not answer the question they promise to, and that kind of stuff out there, kind of go through what's happening in that space. All right, so, compression. So codec, we hear the phrase a lot. It is not, in fact, derived from Kodak, which I've heard a few people uh, guess at. It's short for compressor decompressor. And the, and the idea is really the fundamental thing in compression is there is a bit stream. And an you can think of that as almost like a language. And an encoder looks at a series of images and then summarizes it essentially down into a language as compactly as possible. And then um, a decoder reads that and knows how to turn that back into pixels. And when you really talk about the difference between different codecs, it's basically what is the vocabulary available to do that summarization? And newer, better codecs have a much richer vocabulary, so they can describe video in more complex and nuanced ways that, that therefore a decoder is able to use fewer bits to deliver more information and more accurately give you back what you put into it. Um, and you know, also we talk about encoders as, uh, you know, even when we talk about like say H.264, which is sort of the, today's mainstream video codec, there are lots of different encoders for it and there's no rule for how, you, how a codec does that summarization. You know, the rule, there's a rule for how it has to get played back, but different encoders can go about in a very different way for how they figure out what's the right way to describe that video in a compact fashion, which can lead to, you know, some could use smaller files than others, some can look better for some kinds of content than others, lots of parameters you can tune around there. So the real standards really tells you how to decode the video, but how you encode it is a lot of flexibility and where we see lots of innovation there. Um, so a fundamental concept for people coming from print or kind of RGB kind of workflows is that video codecs don't record the value of a pixel at all. They don't try to. What they really are doing is measuring spatial frequencies. So, you know, if you have like a smooth gradient, that's kind of a low frequency. Think of a frequency as being like how, the amplitude of frequency is how uh, big a gap you can go from, you know, the brightest to darkest pixel. So like a high frequency, if you go all the way from black to white, it would be a high amplitude, low amplitude, would be going from light gray to dark gray or whatever. Um, and then how sharp it is, is um, how high that frequency is gonna be. How quickly does it go from its maximum value to the minimum value? Um, and so, and what this means is uh, the higher the frequency, the more bits it takes to do. And therefore, we're able to do things like a smoother image, a natural image, a gradient, a lot easier than something that's a lot of really sharp edges. So you've probably seen in compression often like 
text or like if it was like some crazy strobing LED light or something like that, you know, it could often look really bad or confetti, tons of little sharp edges happening there. And that's why those often look a lot worse on the same stream while just like a nice like view of the blue sky look excellent at very low bit rates. Um, jump into that somewhere there. Also I want to point out these are all my own personal cranky opinions, you know? So I, I am right about everything, but I only speak for myself. Okay, so this is another example of how the frequencies go. This is just using JPEG here. So, um, and this is, I just did, did this with no anti-aliasing. So like every pixel is either the background or it's like fully white, fully green, whatever. And a few things I want to point out in here is, um, you see this here, that's called ringing, which is a very classic compression error where it didn't have enough bits to actually describe that frequency very accurately without messing up with things around it there. So you get this kind of noise around sharp edges at lower bit rates. It's a very common thing we see in compression. Um, and also look at different colors here and that, uh, you know, for distribution codecs, we normally are subsampling color. So we'll describe luminance for every pixel and then chrominance maybe every two by two block of pixels. So we get, you know, white and black, we get pretty sharp there, but we start going to, uh, pure primary colors, red, green, and blue, edges get softer, they kind of hard to do right there, ringing gets worse, and you'll notice the ringing's in color when it's colored stuff there, because we have the high frequencies are in color as well. Um, and for comparison, let's see this works here. I just, this is the exact same file size, I just anti-alias the text is all. Like any normal human being would do, you're not gonna put alias text up in the 2000s. Um, you know, so just nice soft edges, looks the exact same, and just, you know, the, the artifacts are just way less. Same bit rate, that only, it's only that very slight difference in how soft I drew the edges of the text, like a, like a pixel or two of boundary, where it's going from like all the way black to gray in over three pixels that have one, gives you the difference between that degree of distortion and that degree of distortion. So, if you wanna know why your, why your codes for some kinds of content look bad, other things look good there, or why some of your like pictures you take with your, your camera are a lot larger than other ones you took at the same day, it's, it's pretty much always gonna be down to this in large part, which is how, how many hard, high frequencies, how many sharp edges in detail, fine detail was there in the, in the video. Another thing, the second thing that's a big part of all the distribution codecs, you're not gonna see this in uh, uh, codecs that are used, you know, inside of a plant, like, you know, uh, like, uh, you know anything that's used over 2110 is gonna be an intra-frame only codec where each co frame is encoded independently. But for distribution, we're, we, that's not nearly efficient enough for us. So, um, and that's because if you look at this piece of video, most of the image is the same. If you imagine, for example, I am a guy standing on a stage, and there's a pattern behind me. Visualize if you can. And there's a camera somewhere recording this video. Um, you know, if I'm talking here, we're recording this to say 24 frames a second, and I'm kind of walking around here, and I go like this, and think for a while. Not a lot has changed. All the background's totally the same, maybe a little bit of like noise in CCD or whatever. I might move over here or there. You know, pretty straightforward. And it's not just like erasing the pixels there. It goes, oh, hey, that shirt's got this one pattern. I'm gonna move it over this way. And a more advanced code, it'll do like, oh, this pattern's there. It kind of repeats there. So I'm gonna like copy it from this part of the image down to here because it's the same sort of pattern and maybe you like adjust it a little bit. You know, it was a look at the parts of the image that are similar and the parts that are the same between images and only save the changes. So huge savings here. This is a pretty typical distribution here. So an iframe is a fully intracoded frame. It's th this, this is the first that's fully described by itself. You always have to start with one of those because you, know, you have to have something you can play back by itself. And then we have uh, P frames or predicted frames and the P frame references the iframe there and it's able to say, give you about the same quality there in a fraction of the bit rate because it's just predicting what that's gonna be uh, from that. So this is like, I'm like this but with this difference or I'm like this this one goes to this one, this difference from that one, this one there, you know. And you'll see it's bigger at some point, so probably, you know, if you think like, this changes there, but like if I do like this, you know, that's when you would get a larger. And then also we have like frames, like a B frame, which will look at both directions. 
um, which are again somewhat smaller because they have more things to reference, and so it can look into the future sort of. And then we have, uh, uh, then we also have a thing called non-reference B, and that's a frame that's just gonna get thrown away. It just looks at any frames around it there, but nothing's based on it. So you can kind of skip them when you're playing back for like a fast forward experience or random access. And because nothing is based on them, they don't have to be as good, they just have to look good enough in there. And so all this, you know, if you were just doing it for, so this is, you know, using inside of a plant, like a JGK or whatever, all the frames would be that size, roughly. But here we're able to just, you know, save a ton there, you know, we're saving 90% of the bits at the same playback quality. Obviously, obviously some trade-offs in terms of, uh, you know, latency and other kinds of things, how fast it is to do, but, you know, um, you know, it was really everything's about getting the, getting the best bang for the bit out of distribution content. So, but there are so many codecs, why are there all of these, why can't we just get it right there? Um, so think about, for us there's just different uses for codecs, you know, obviously, which are before, like for a production codec, we're using it inside of a plant, we're trying to make things in real time, we're really trying to replicate the old analog experience where things just happened, you know, at the speed of light. Um, for those, you know, we could afford higher bit rates there, but we're not gonna have interframe encoding, it makes it easier, all that kind of stuff, and it needs to be able to be able to be both played back and also to be created in real time without a lot of latency. Um, you know, on systems pretty easily there. You can't have like some big expensive box for every time you wanna play out a thing to a different device. Um, yeah, for, and then for distribution, we have complex codecs or interframe, they do all kinds of stuff. And this is a huge, massive market um, with massive pressure for there. I mean, you know, think about a company like a Comcast or a Dish or whatever, they sell people channels. And if they can squeeze 20% more channels that they can sell people into the same amount of radio frequency spectrum they have available to themselves, that's more money for them. And so rel even small improvements in efficiency of compression, if you can get the same experience, more bang for the bit, uh, then they're able to make a lot more money. And also, you know, you know the, the bit rates we're t we t today are delivering HDR and 4K, we, could, we were delivering, um, yeah, that's much higher than a Blu-ray, so we're delivering 4K HDR streaming at lower bit rates than a 1080p SDR Blu-ray was. And really, we're able to do some things in 4K HDR at about DVD bit rates. And that's just how, talk about co improvements in codecs over time. We're able to do, code things more efficiently and get things on there. And that makes, and so every time you have an improvement in codecs, that means you can deliver experiences to either people whose bandwidth wasn't good enough before or just whole new types of things that were not possible before. So that really drives a lot of innovation. And one of the reasons why OTT services have re really were the first out there with like things like 4K and HDR and other new technologies is because well, as long as the decoder's there, the bits can get there, um, and the innovation can happen really quickly, and take advantage of, of those new codecs there. And the whole history of codecs is basically ta taking massive improvements in compute uh, from Moore's Law into small improvements in efficiency. So, um, like whenever Intel comes out and says, oh, this new processor is 10 to 45% faster, or whatever there, 45% is always, the biggest number is always for video compression, essentially, because we can use up tons of cores and use all the SIM instructions and AVX 512, all that kind of stuff. Those are all things that speed us up there. Um, you know, we get, you know, Word doesn't get much faster with every new processor, but compression gets massively better every generation. Um, and I'd say roughly, you know, every decade for the customer we care about, we get about a thousand times an increase in how much in code we can, we can do, and we get maybe a 50% reduction in bit rate. But it's not a great ratio, so thank you to, the, to our wonderful fab engineers who are making the cost of transistors get cheaper every year, really pays off there. And we see about a doubling in decoder complexity. So essentially, you know, so 50% less and 100% more, that's half and double, so about the same thing there. So, you know, we really don't have to make the decoders that much more complex, which is okay, because that's what goes into everything. Um, but, you know, we can spend a lot more money on encoders, which is why MPEG-2 is way better now than it was in our first launch. I mean, people are still making better MPEG-2 encoders in the last few years. We're still getting better AVC encoders um, because we just spend more, we just know more about having a video look good and we can just spend a lot more MIPS per pixel on it when we're doing it. The other big thing is patent license complexity, which has become a huge thing in the last bit here. So, right now, 
like, we're almost to 2020, which always is the distant future, but now it's here now. So, and we have crazy new science fiction codecs available to us, which is kind of cool. We are living in the far future. Um, you know, still have MPEG-2 around, DVD, so, some legacy digital broadcast. ATSC in the US is all still MPEG-2, it's all out there. That was like kind of our first kind of mainstream thing there. We see ABC H.264 is kind of the mainstream codec most places. Um, you know, same quality, half the bit rate of MPEG-2. Um, this is what most streaming services are going to use. Uh, more recent broadcast services, all that kind of stuff. Set top boxes where they can get the streams there. Um, HEVC is the, kind of the fault there. So it's the, I guess these are most of the 4K and HDR stuff. Um, it's better than 264 is by a good chunk, maybe 2% with some caveats there. Um, but there's a lot of patent mess you may have heard about, like, oh, there's all these different patent pools, they don't say what it costs and all that kind of stuff, and that's a thing. So I'm not an attorney, so I don't need to solve that problem, but I will validate it. Um, you guys have VP9 is a royalty-free one. Um, AV1 is a big attempt at a royalty-free codec. It's ballpark HEVC quality, kind of complex. We're kind of seeing where that's going to go, the, the evolution there. And then kind of on the wings, we have uh, the VVC codec, which is, follows the classic MPEG model there. Really very good, but there's nothing really yet in place to avoid the whole patent issues with that. Probably done in 2020. And we have MPEG-5 EVC, which is an attempt to basically do kind of an AV1-like thing based on MPEG technologies. That's about 20% better than HEVC. That also should be done next year. And this hopefully will make this work out there. So that's kind of what's going on there. And that was my time. So thank you very much. All righty. Yeah. I think that describes it perfectly, right? What? Already? 8K is here. Um, I'm having a hard time getting my head around how fast it's appeared. Um, it's appeared in bits and pieces. Try to like a little sense of it this morning. Um, I can't answer all the questions, but um, maybe we can clear up what's actually going on here. What's driving this push to 8K? I mean, what is, what is as my father used to say, what's the, what's the hurry, where's the fire? Um, there's a whole not, a number of factors behind this push to 8K. Some of these are kind of obvious. Some of these you may not know much about. Part of it's ongoing technical innovation. A lot of it is supply chain management and profitability. Some of it's cutting edge marketing hype. Some of you might say a lot of it is cutting edge marketing hype. And there's been why I like to call a lot of building the plane while flying it. And if there's a phrase that perfectly describes 8K, it is building the plane while we're flying it. So we have 8K video and we have displays coming, as you'll find out later today. Now, a lot of this is being driven by what's happening in the world of displays. I'm sure some of you or maybe all of you have wandered into the uh, exhibitor area and you've seen the LG 88-inch uh, 8K OLED that's in there. Um, CES earlier this year was full of 8K television models and demonstrations. Um, at the moment, and this can change, because I looked it up just before I came out here, there were nine models of 8K TVs for sale, and I'm just curious, does anybody here own an 8K TV? Good. <clears throat> Showing some common sense. <laughs> Screen sizes start at 55 inches, go up to 98 inches. Originally they were going to start at 65, now there's a 55 out there, and I believe the reason it's out there is because they're not selling that many 8K TVs to begin with. So they figured maybe we'll make a smaller one and people will buy it. Prices range from $2,500 to $70,000, just $70,000. You know, nothing, just a drop in the bucket. Um, all models support high dynamic range, wide color gamut, unlike some of the earlier Ultra HD TVs where these um, add-ons were not supported. All the 8K TVs do support this. Um, the display interfaces are largely limited to HDMI 2.0. It appears that the OLED that we saw in the other room actually is running HDMI 2.1, the faster uh, digital interface um, at about 24 gigabits per second. But wait, we're still getting used to 4K and Ultra HD. How many of you have a 4K or Ultra HD TV? Okay. And I'll bet you a lot of you bought it because, wow, it was cheap and it was big. Or, well, in that size, that's about all the, the only choice I had because that's basically what's happening. The price of 4K TVs has dropped so much it's pushing full HD sets out of the market. So are we really ready to move to 8K? Well, think about this for a minute. 
this, these are rough timelines. We transitioned from standard def TV to 720p resolution over roughly about a seven year period. And then over the next seven years, we kind of transitioned from 720p to what they call full HD or 1080p. So it's been six and a half years since the first ultra HD TVs appeared in 2012. And if we all know they're dirt cheap now. So the LCD panel makers, uh, and certainly to a lesser extent OLED panel makers, are ramping up 8K production because there's no money left in making 4K televisions. And that's the next wave. So. Uh, the display, display so, um, supply chain consultants, Insight Media, are now predicting 5.4 million 8K TVs will ship worldwide in 2022, but 60% of those sales will be in China. Those numbers are subject to change every day. So just in perspective, um, all things being equal, that's what an 8K TV looks like compared to Full HD. So it is 16 times the resolution of a, of a Full HD TV, or about 33 million pixels with the same aspect ratio. Now, we had this discussion numerous times. If I had a dime for everybody, every time somebody said to me, you'll never see the pixels. You could sit right on top of the thing. That's not the point. The point is the TV sets are getting bigger. So you're not supposed to sit close to it. Your mom told you that. Don't sit so close to the TV, it'll ruin your eyes, okay? The point is that the TV screens are getting larger. One of the fastest growth segments for 8K is 65 inches. That's also true for the Ultra HD sets. So stop worrying about the pixels, okay? We have more than enough pixels for everybody. We bought, we bought enough for everybody. So some perspective, when you're working with full HD, and again, my numbers are primarily from the display side, because that's where I come into the industry, but you're working with 150 megahertz clock rates, usually 8-bit color, the 709 color space. Your data rates are around four and a half, maybe a little bit more gigabits a second, and HDMI 1.4 is plenty fast enough for that. So even with 12-bit RGB color, you're not gonna exceed eight gigabits a second for that signal at 60 hertz. Um, so if you're working with 4K, your clock rates are now around 600 megahertz. You've got 10-bit color. Now you have the 2020 color space. Your data rates are running from eight gigabits a second to 32 gigabits a second. HDMI 2 is barely fast enough to work within the constraints of Ultra HD. And if you're doing 10-bit RGB color, your data rate's gonna exceed 20 gigabits a second. With 8K, you're working with clock rates at 1.2 and 2.4 gigahertz. With 10 and 12-bit color, the 2020 color space, uncompressed data rates from 18 to 96 gigabits a second. Okay, put that in your pipe and smoke it. <clears throat> so it just didn't happen overnight. A lot of people think, wait a minute, all of a sudden, we, where'd all this 8K stuff come from? You know, why do we have 8K TV? So you probably didn't notice, but this has been going on for a while. Let's refresh your memory. NHK, who's going to speak this morning at 11, has been experimenting with 8K since 1995. Yep, it's actually been going on that long. They showed a 4K, 2K camera in 2004, exhibited their first 8K sensor at NEB in 2006. They started covering the Olympics in 2012 with a couple of viewing stations in 8K. 8K super high vision coverage of all Olympics started in 2016, and they had their 22.2 sound system standardized by SMPTE in 2018, or two, I'm sorry, 2008. Um, they also, and if you remember, if you were at this conference a few years ago, they built a four pound 8K camera that works with a steady camera to replace their larger and very bulky models. And over the next several years, apparently these guys didn't go to sleep at all. They just were working around the clock. They showed 8K 120 hertz production, simultaneous 8K 4K 2K output from a camera, and 8K slow-mo recording and playback. And if you had been coming to the conference, you would have known all this. And basically, they have engineered this entire system from scratch, which is why I say they're building the plane while they're flying it. So it's been in the works for a while. Ultra HD TVs were being introduced to customers worldwide back in 2012. And adoption of 4K TVs really began ticking up in 2014, with the majority of TVs sold by the end of next year will be Ultra HD. Um, NHK continued to develop 8K acquisition, storage, editing, transmission hardware, and software. So all the Olympics were covered through 2018 in 8K. They demonstrated a practical method for UHF broadcasting using both horizontal and vertical polarization of radio waves, and they launched a dedicated satellite service last year to deliver 8K to the home. Um, and sensors, as far as camera sensors go, um, Canon showed a prototype 50 megapixel sensor at their 2010 Expo. 
nine years ago. NHK showed 120 hertz CMOS sensor at NAB in 2012. Uh, Samosis showed their 8K sensor in 2016. So we've been seeing these sensors for the better part of 12 years. Um, and then last year, Panasonic introduced what's called a global shutter sensor that uses an organic photoconductive film layer. We're going to hear more about that this morning. That can do 8K 60 frames per second using uh, in-pixel gain switching technology, high-speed noise cancellation. Um, and it is really cool because by varying the voltage on it, you now have an infinitely variable neutral density filter built into the camera. So on the display side, it's all been, you know, roses. There's no profit in 4K TV panel manufacturing and sales today. Um, the largest fabs in the world for all of this are in China. They're switching their focus to 8K. Um, companies like uh, TCL, which is China Star Optical Electronics Technologies, partnering with Samsung, Foxconn, BOE, we all know them. Um, they're building these large fabs, uh, Gen 10 and a half and Gen 11, and that generation is based on the size of what they call mother glass. So when these pieces of mother glass are made in one of these fabs, they measure roughly 11 feet by 10 feet, okay? And you don't want to be the guy that has to move that off the assembly line over to, to cut it. Um, LG and Samsung have also started uh, 8K OLED and LCD production in, in Korea, but most of that is going to move to China just because of the fixed cost of producing these panels. We also have 8K commercial signage. You can buy it now. Um, it's using the same panels as you find in the consumer televisions, both OLED and LCD. Um, a lot of these panels support high dynamic range wide color gamut. Uh, some of them use quantum dot technology. Some of them use uh, incredibly dense arrays of mini LEDs in the backlight to get high dynamic range. And believe it or not, there are actually advantages to moving to 8K, especially when you're doing tiling for video walls, command and control operations, surveillance, process control, where people need really fine detail. So uh, I can build an 8K wall out of four displays, or I can just get one 8K display, or I can take four of those and I can build a 16K display. And if I want to put gold on the frames, I can have a 14K display, I suppose. Um, and all of these companies have introduced 8K cameras. Sharp, Sony, Hitachi, Red. Um, thanks to Larry, it filled me in on this. Uh, the sensor sizes are primarily Super 35 and 1.25 inch. Majority of the cameras are using a single sensor with a Bayer array. Uh, solid state drives are a must for recording because of the right read speeds. Um, and all of these cameras support hybrid log gamma for HDR and uh, one camera supports in addition to that S-log. So we have some light compression in the camera, mezzanine level roughly 7 to 1 seems to be the number everybody's zeroing in on and they're writing about 6 gigabits a second of data. So that means for 40 minutes of video you need about a terabyte of storage. So if these numbers are starting to get you a little concerned, you should be concerned. This is an awful lot of data that we're writing and transporting and, and displaying. Um, and there's even an 8K consumer DSLR if you really want to spend the money on it. Uh, this was shown at CES and finalized at NAB. It's a micro four thirds 8K sensor, records for 4320p30, can't do 60, using H265. Um, it's got a UHS-2 SD card slot, little flip out viewfinder. Um, the price is only $5,000, I mean, you know, nothing. But wait, there's more. There's, there's more parts to this ecosystem, such as 8K video walls. I've seen demonstrations truly amazing of 8K medical imaging. I'm actually doing oh, uh, heart surgery uh, and other icky things, as my wife described it, inside your body, but with incredible detail and, of course, high dynamic range provides accurate color. Uh, on the lower left, an 8K 240 hertz sensor, which we will hear about this morning, how that was designed. Um, demonstrations of 8K over IP, and uh, actually an 8K nonlinear editing workflow. And uh, speaking to Siegfried uh, Fossil yesterday about what does he think is the safe maximum level to compress 8K 10 to 1 using JPEG XS? Well, that'll get you um, 8K 60, 422, 10-bit. That'll allow you to run it through a 10 gig network switch, which is pretty amazing. So there's really a whole lot of everything going on here with 8K all over the place. Uh, some of these efforts are coordinated. Some are happening independently of each other. Again, the whole system is not finished yet. The plane is in the air, but we don't have all the engines going and we don't have the fuselage completely assembled and hopefully we have enough electronics to fly it. 
But 8K sensors have four times the density of 4K, 16 times that of full HD. The data rates, of course, are going to be four times that of 4K and 16 times that of full HD. 8K acquisition always employs HDR and wide color gamut, which pushes up your bit rates. High frame rate is going to become a part of this toolkit down the road. Uh, one of the things that NHK discovered in some of their tests is that the screens get bigger and the field of view increases. People become more aware of flicker. And their tests show that we really need to be running refresh rates on these big screens with 8K resolution somewhere above 80 times a second or 80 hertz. 8K signals are too fast for 10 gig networks without some sort of compression. So a bare bones plain vanilla version of 8K, which might be 4320p30, 8-bit 420, already is at 9 gigabits a second. So we obviously have to do some compression. Uh, they require multiple 12G SDI links. Every, eventually, may, we may move to 24G uh, SDI optical. I was talking about this with Thomas Mason. I think it's simply 2036.3. We may have to go to 24G, and it's likely to be an optical interface. And it requires lots of storage. Again, one terabyte and up, and really, really fast solid state drives. And of course, the display interfaces aren't fast enough. Those you know, I'm a chronic complainer about this. But um, even though we do have a display in there running HDMI 2.1, run, it's running at about 24 gigabits a second. So if I want to do 60 frame, 4320p, 10 bit, I need to be running at 48 gigabits a second. And to my knowledge, there is no TV out there or monitor that's capable of sustaining that bus speed to drive the television. And here we go. So. This table, and if anybody wants these slides, I'll be happy to send you a PDF of them, shows you uh, some of the data rates you're going to be dealing with here. I personally think we may have warp drive uh, working before we get to achieve some of these speeds. But if you look down at the very bottom, you're doing 422 10-bit 120 hertz. You're running at 114 gigabits a second, which to some people might as well be just made up a made-up number like 11 billion, as somebody said yesterday. So, in our AK session, and this is an unabashed promotion for it, we are going to hear about an optical photoconductive film camera sensor for 8K, which is a really cool development. This could be the next generation of camera sensors. Think of adding a preamplifier to a weak signal to be able to boost the signal and noise ratio and the overall level. So, I'm predicting that this will be the next big thing for UHD and beyond, because it does solve a lot of issues we have with small sensors with really dense 8K pixels and being able to get enough light through them so we can stop down a lens and get some depth of field. A 1.25 inch 3 CMOS multifunctional high speed camera, which can actually capture at 120, 240, and 480 hertz. And I don't even want to guess what the data rate is for 100, 480 hertz. Well, they're doing a little bit of a trick here because they're actually down converting to 120 to get it off the camera. And finally, deploying a 4K, 8K um, system for the home, satellite broadcast system to the home, which took a lot of scotch tape, paper clips, and some very clever thinking and runs into some pretty basic obstacles such as existing wiring and physical plant within a uh, cable system or a satellite distribution system. So while we're sitting here scratching our heads looking at some of these numbers and figuring how we're going to make this all work, uh, they actually are making it work over in Japan. So that concludes uh, my presentation. And um, I guess my question is, are you ready? Is anybody really ready for this? Well, we'll find out at 11 o'clock. And uh, thank you very much. Good morning. My name is Chris Whitmire. I'm the director of broadcast production and new media technology for NASCAR. How many people have been here before by a show of hands? How many people saw me present before, not in front of the coffee bar yesterday, but perhaps in 2018? Excellent. For the four or five who saw it, you're in for a treat. Also for the four or five in the back, who drove the number 43? Ah, we got to work on that Richard Petty. We'll do it again in 2020. So we're doing a workflow primer today. We're going to teach you about workflows really quickly because, you can see, as you can see, they're very varying. Heck, putting on your pants in the, in the morning is a workflow. So what is a workflow? The sequence of industrial, administrative, or other process through which a piece of work passes from initiation to completion. So what makes these good workflows? Well, I live in Charlotte, North Carolina. I had to find a way to get here. And as you can see, I had to find the end, right? Begin with the end in mind. Now, I had a lot of options to get there, and we'll go through those shortly. But the next thing I had to do was understand the resources. We all have finite uh, uh, resources out there, our people. 
are assets. Some would say, are people not assets? My HR department would say otherwise. They're people, assets are very different. We have time, of course, and we have money. We, of course, need to put some research into what in the world we're doing. A lot of great sources out there. You've got search engines, the Sempty Journal, hopefully you're all subscribed, trade shows, colleagues, and what I like to refer to as future friends, people I meet today so that I can ask them questions, and some, maybe someday we'll be friends, but maybe they'll also help me out in my journey from my workflows. An open architecture. This is not always something that people think about. I will tell you that as each one of these blocks that we have here, we've changed them numerous times. So for example, our edit system has changed three times in 12 years, courtesy of the different flow that we see with different companies. Our asset management companies have changed three or four times as well. Storage, we cycle that out every three years. Those JBODs could be a different vendor next year. You don't know. So by keeping an open architecture, that allows us to actually be very open to be able to move around and be very flexible. Simplify, simplify, simplify. Who said that? I think it was Thoreau, for those who are paying attention. Who drove the 43? All right, we got one person awake in the back. All right, so the path to the end is not always what you would think, right through the middle from one to four to seven. And anybody know what this exact diagram is called? Oh, jeez. It's called a Dijkstra's algorithm. Uh, it allows you to find the shortest path from one point to the other. Um, and for those that are actually paying attention and doing the math in their head, that's the shortest path right there, one, three, four to seven. Don't check it, I'm not sure if it was actually right when I wrote that. Documentation. I love working for NASCAR, but I promise you I would not be there for the rest of my life. Make your documentation. A Couple of tools I recommend out there, OmniGraffle, creating nice workflow charts so that they can be updated regularly by other coworkers, perhaps yourself as well. Microsoft Word, slap them in there, create a nice diagram and documentation with that. And for all of our executive team out there, they do love PowerPoint uh, to simplify it down to seven to 10 slides. Never stop. We started doing asset management in NASCAR approximately 13 years ago, at least when I adopted the project. And since then we've been doing many, many iterations and updates. In fact, the codecs have changed, the edit systems have changed. I think everything has changed and we continue to move forward. Always revisit your workflows. They will constantly change. So the seven keys, begin with the end in mind. Understand your resources. Research, open architecture, simplify, documentation, and never stop. So I'm gonna give you a case study because people like to see these diagrams to see how we think about our problems and give you a solution. And again, when you come out to the session today, you're gonna see some workflow diagrams and some ideas that you've never thought of, and hopefully it changes the way you think about things. Case study number one, 13 years ago, starting to archive the history of NASCAR. These were four of our uh, challenges, our goals, if you will. Archive all past and future footage in a mezzanine format that does not degrade the quality of the existing source material. We started ingesting stuff with one inch, beta SP, beta cam, you name it, they found a way to shoot it and we found a way to buy it and ingest it. Content available 24-7, 365 for various outputs from search to editorial to anybody who may want to request that file has access to it. Permissions aside and such. Discover, uh, disaster recovery plan. We cannot go down and if something does happen, how do we recover? And of course, attaching various levels of metadata to that for logging and such. And so here's one of those lovely diagrams built in OmniGraffle. And as you can see, it's quite complex but if you take time to look at it, it simplifies a complex workflow into something super simple. Now you're gonna take note on that, this is uh, version 2018, and yes, in the last year, it has changed yet again. We moved to the cloud. So now we have to think about how we handle our storage and how we move all that data yet again. Again, with easy to update diagrams, we're able to move forward and do these such things. Case study number two, new source formats. You're gonna hear a lot about uh, HDR, UHD, all that sort of, these new fun formats out there, 8K, apparently we can get a 14K as well, I, that's new to me. The new source formats, support for new camera formats, various frame sizes, frame rates, et cetera. Support for HDR and log. Compatible with existing archive. As you can see, we've taken a very complex thing. Something such as all these various file formats and camera formats and such that are coming into our facility. 
we've managed to take a diagram and simplify it into what we refer to as sausage, right? It's actually artisanal sausage at this point. It's no longer one format, it's multiple. And as you can see, the 480 stuff stays 480. The 720 is 720. That was our house standard as of like last week, and we've since then changed. 1080 now becomes 720. 2K DCI, I don't know what we do with the extra 200 pixels, so we just cut it off, make it 1080p. 4K UHD is now the 4K standard for us because, again, the uh, digital cinema DCI group, they keep adding pixels in them. We don't know what to do with it, so we just cut it off. And because it's a standard, you also take note in that nice diagram of, oh, there's some DCI folks in here. I don't know what you guys do. Anyway, uh, you'll take note that we also keep the existing aspect ratio, so it's 16 by 9. So again, we've taken all the various file formats. We said we want a rectangle to look like this, and doesn't matter how we're going to scale it in and out. And we've created this new workflow format in our workflows. So again, seven keys. Actually, let's go back one. Driver of the 43. Wow, you guys are really Richard Petty. We'd also accept numerous other answers at this point. Seven keys to workflow, begin with the end of mind. Re understand your resources, research, open architecture, simplify documentation, and never stop adjusting. Thank you. Okay, so my name is Pierre, or Pete. Um, I'm also the instructor of the HDR course for SEMTI, so if you want to learn more about HDR, uh, you're more than welcome to enroll. We have two courses online, one which is supervised, so I give an hour every week so that I can answer questions and things like that. We also have one that is self-study. Uh, you can register at any time and follow the different modules. So here I'm going to try and condense what is uh, eight weeks of training into 20 minutes. So it's the short, short, short version of HDR. So I'm focusing more on the aspects that are important pertaining to this afternoon's session. So I'm going to spend less time on formats and displays and more on uh, things that are pertinent for this afternoon. Okay. The first thing we need to do is understand the fundamental principles of light and how light works. Basically, before the discovery of fire, uh, the only things that we could see was because we have a sun not so close to us that is gigantic, emitting a lot of photons, and this is what enables us to perceive light. Since then, we've adapted with fire, with incandescent, Dell, LED, and whatever other technologies we have, but the principle is the same. The reason I see you and the reason is you see me is because we have light, and light, what is it? No one's exactly sure what it is. But we understand that it has two very important properties, and these are properties that are required if we are to capture any Im images in the modern world. So l light behaves like particles, so it has a certain energy and uh, mass properties. This is what we call the quantum properties of light. This is where it is different from sound, for example. The reason you're hearing me is because it's a compression wave that has air as a medium to reach your ears. If you go in outer space, you're not going to hear any sound because there is no medium to transport it. But we do see light from the stars because they carry their own energy and so they can travel in a vacuum. So those two properties, the properties of waves, which create different colors, and the light intensity, which comes from its energy, um, are what allows us to capture and display light. So they're very important because what we technically call dynamic range is strictly the measure of intensity. So in capture, what is the most, the highest level of energy that I can measure in relationship with the lowest level? And the terms of display is what is the brightest that I can display and the darkest or the least amount of light that I can actually display on the screen. That creates the dynamic range. In commercial terms, when we talk about HDR, they tend to encompass as well the color gamut. So when we talk about 4K or Ultra HD TVs with HDR, we're actually talking about both dynamic range and the color gamut. The color gamut of light, the way we capture it is with color filters that are before the sensor, because the sensor typically is only measuring energy. 
So you need to tell it it's the energy of which color that is coming in. And as I'll show you later, we hope we use different principles for that, whether you're shooting 35 millimeter film or using a digital camera, it's not exactly the same way. But it is the idea that we are separating those wavelengths to capture uh, the color's uh, frequency, which is basically uh, the way we perceive it as red, green, or blue. Those two aspects, dynamic range and uh, color gamut, which we'll transfer together as color volume, are as follows. On the left-hand side, this is the amount of light energy that is emitted by different sources. That's expressed, if you come from Europe, you'll call it candela per square meters, which sounds a bit more scientific. If you're in North America, you'll call them nits, which is an easier unit. It's, it's the same thing, it's just a different name. So at the very end, in a very dark night where there's no power, no electricity, no human-generated light, and all you see are the, are the stars above, for example, if you go on top of Mount Haleakala in Hawaii at 3 in the morning, you will see something around 0 0.004 nits. It will take you 15, 20 minutes to get used to it because you had light in your car going up, but once you get used to it, you're going to see a whole constellation, tons of constellations out there. You can even see the Milky Way. It's super impressive. But it takes time for our eyes to adjust to that. Up to 50,000 candela per square meters, you can perceive this given a certain adaptation time. At 50,000, you're going to start to burn your retina, so it's too much energy being thrown inside your eye, and it's going to hurt, and eventually you're going to go blind. The sun over there is at 1.6 billion nits, so that's why we don't look directly at the sun. So our TVs are going to be somewhere in between, and our cap capability of capturing is also going to be somewhere in between all of these. On the right-hand side, that's our color perception. So there were studies done in the 1930s by the Commission Internationale de l'Éclairage, which acronym you probably know, CIE and that's the CIE 1931 model. Basically, what they discovered is that our eyes are sensitive to three different wavelengths of light, short, medium, and large. And the short are corresponding to the color red, medium color green, and high color blue. So our eyes are sensitive to RGB stimulus, which is why most uh, imaging devices are based on RGB. And our eyes uses those RGB primary sources of information to interpolate all the colors in between. So that is everything the eye can see. And if you're creating uh, assets in ACES, it will encompass all of that. So combining in a horizontal plane the color gamut and in a vertical plane the intensity that you can display gives you a color volume. This is the entire array of dynamic range and gamut that your display can present or that your camera can capture on the other sense. We call it the small x, small y, big y color volume. The small x and small y is the color gamut and the big y is the light intensity. So from darkest to brightest. And you will notice that that color gamut uh, graphic is not uniform at all levels of intensity. Um, so it means our displays, we need to determine nominal levels when we calculate the color gamut and why a lot of people are shifting when you're measuring the capabilities of the a display from color gamut to actual color volume. So where are our displays with regards to all of this? Um, if we look at history, our high def, high definition, like this monitor here, uh, the signal that feeds it is calibrated at 100 nits or candela per square meter. It's not very bright. The reason behind it is that when we switch to digital high definition, they wanted to have backwards compatibility with cathode ray tubes. And if you go brighter than that on the CRT, you're going to burn the phosphor on the screen. So that's the historical reason why our Rec 709 uh, 
light maximum intensity is 100 candela per square meter on TVs. Of course, modern TVs don't use CRTs anymore. Most TVs by manufacturers are more in the 200 to 300 range, but they map the signal that they receive to a, a greater level of intensity, which means it's very hard when you're monitoring in a grading suite with a calibrated monitor at 100 nits to get the exact same color when you go back in your home. The high-end consumer HDR models are around 1,000 nit peak brightness, lower-end HDR around six to 700 nits. The highest-end professional monitors are around 4,000 nits, and in systems that encode absolute values like uh, perceptual quantizer or PQ or SEMT2084, they assign exact code values to luminance and the maximum encodable value is 10,000 nits. On the gamut side, we see that REC 709 is the smallest triangle. Once again, that goes back to the uh, cathode ray tube history. This was the best that could be achieved with the latest phosphors at the time, so the red, green, and blue phosphors. So we're stuck with a standard that is way below what our technologies like OLED and the more recent screens are capable of displaying. The next level of the triangle is DCI-P3, which was based uh, for digital cinema on the best that was achievable at the time using uh, digital micro mirror devices with um, with the lamps of the time, the like xenon lamps, and it was pretty close to the gamut of a film print, and that was the idea, was to make it look like film. Now, with laser, they've been able to narrow down the wavelength and go further, and the REC 2020 standard is based on the best available uh, RGB lasers of the time. So none of them are actually based on what was captured, they're based on displaying technology. So a TV that is 2020 enabled, it doesn't mean that it will display at all because we don't have, outside of laser, uh, home display technologies that can actually reach 100% of 2020. They will take the code values, interpret them as this is the theoretical color I'm getting, and tone map it down just like they do with brightness to the capabilities of the display. This is why we need metadata when we send uh, color information and luminance information to the television in HDR so I can interpret what it receives to a device that is not capable of displaying at all. I'll talk a bit about film because you have some presentation this afternoon about uh, film and film grain. So just quickly, film is a much older process than television. When it's switched to color, they're using a series of dyes or pigments in the film. This is like a cross cut of the very thin strip of film. There's actually many, many layers in there. There are layers that will capture the complementary colors to RGB, which for, uh, as you can see on, on the graphic, for blue is yellow, for red is cyan, and for green is magenta, because it's a negative. When you make it a positive, you will get your RGB values. So light goes in and it's filtered by different series of color filters, and there's grains, little crystals in the film that are photosensitive. If a photon hits the grain, it will change its opacity when you develop it, and this is what creates the capture of light. So once again, we separate the properties, the wavelengths are separated through dyes, and little crystal will capture the light intensity. The way the crystals in the film or the, the grain reacts to light is not in a linear fashion. If I put twice as much light, it's not gonna be twice as opaque as a negative. It's a nonlinear curve that is not the same as our eyes. This is our eyes on the right-hand side. This is film on the left-hand side. It's not exactly the same, but it follows the same principle. And that combined with the look of those different dyes in the film, this together combines what we call the film look. This is why a film doesn't look like a video on the screen. There's frame rate, yes, but there's reasons when you project a 35 millimeter movie why it looks so different is because the way that light interacts with film 
is uh, creating a sort of art, a form of art of its own that is not duplicated in anything else in real life. So, like I said, the film look is a combination of dyes in the film that will create the color gamut and the crystals or the particles, the grain, that will change opacity depending on the light intensity or photons hitting it. Digital cameras are very different, we'll get to that, but first I want to talk a bit about film grain because some people are not entirely sure what's the phenomenon of grain in the film versus digital noise in a camera, and they're very different. The reason we see film grain is because this is the mechanism, like I said, that captures light intensity. And a single photon hitting one of those grains will change its capacity, uh, its intensity. It will change the opacity level. So if you don't have a lot of light, you're gonna grow bigger grains on your film to make sure that photons hit them. And if you have a lot of light, you're gonna make finer grain because you know photons are gonna hit them anyways. Those photons uh, hitting the film, the particles are not homogeneous. You have multiple layers and they're different at every single frame. So that means that there's gonna be a pattern between the light that hits the positive of all those different layers of color before it comes out. And that will create what we call the film grain, which is that random pattern created by multiple layers of grain. So when we see grain in film, and we can see grain, I've seen some of the first uh, HDR demos uh, scanned from film masters, and I was amazed to see grain into very, very bright explosions. The reason is because when you film with the negative, you have a lot more opacity in the bright areas, and so you have a lot of those grains working. When there's no light hitting the sensor, it, when you develop it, uh, the film I mean, when you develop it, it's gonna be very clear, and that's what you see here. The dark areas in her eye are not seeing as much grain as the brighter area once we print the positive. So it does create visibility issues uh, into our uh, HDR masters of uh, film when we digitize them because it's a look we're not used to with digital cameras. So the digital camera does not work with film, of course. What it does is multiple steps. First of all, filters to remove anything that is non-visible light that is considered for us like pollution. We don't want to see this in the final image. So infrared, ultraviolet, haze, and those things, we have filters before the sensor. Then we have a series of microcolor filters, the Bayer array, for those that are familiar with single uh, sensors, or if you're using to third imagers, you're using a prism to separate the fundamental colors. But in large CMOS sensors, we have an array of red, green, and blue. Typically, two greens for one red and one blue, just because it has more intensity and it is more prevalent. So we don't need to sample as much of red and blue. There's just simply less in our environment. So what you have now is a series of photons that address different photosites on the sensor, and that's basically just a solar panel. What it does is you send the photons, they displace electrons, you measure the current, you put this in a digital value, and you're on to the next frame. The integration time is the time that this little bucket is open to capture photons and measure current. At, after that, it's reset, and you're off to the next frame. Digital cameras have a linear response because they're just measuring electrons. So if you send twice as many photons, you're just gonna get twice as many electrons. So you can't really look at a digital linear image the way the sensor captures it. It just doesn't look good on our screens. Because our screens are formatted more uh, to emulate CRTs or to look like our human eye perception. This is why companies like IRI, for example, have been very successful with their digital cameras because they take that linear response and they transform it to adapt it to the properties of intensity response of traditional film. So cinematographers using them think they have a better camera because it looks and behaves more like film. It's actually a post process after the sensor to rebalance the light response more like what film would do. 
So we had grain in film. What we have in digital is noise, and it's a different phenomenon. The bucket that receives the photons has a limited capacity. If you send too many photons to the sensor, it will displace too many electrons. When the bucket is full, it will just tell you I have a value of 100% and clip the information. So overexposure is our greatest danger in digital because once the bucket is full, I've lost all information and I cannot go back and get it. If you don't have enough uh, light, what happens is that your signal is very low. There is inherent noise in the sensors. They will receive uh, cosmic radiation, uh, interference from all of our wireless devices. Heat will also spontaneously generate a very small number of electrons. So if your signal is too low and you try to boost it, you're going to boost that noise as well, which is going to create digital noise. So it's very different from, uh, from film. In film, you can expose as bright as you want, a very high lat tolerance to overexposure. You don't have that in digital. Once the bucket is full, you've lost all of your information. So in conclusion, the whole idea of HDR from the get-go, and that's a graphic from the inception of HDR that was uh, advanced micromirror devices, AMD, that created this uh, a number of years back. The idea is that in front of the camera, we have a scene that has a certain light intensity and certain colors, and through our process, traditionally, we're diminishing all of this for a display device that has very limited physical capabilities to reproduce light intensity and color. The goal of HDR is to widen that, to reduce the diminishing from what's in front of the camera to the TV by having colors that are more faithful to the source and more contrast more faithful to the source. And that's, I think, what you need to know for our afternoon session on HDR. And that's it for me. Thank you. Uh, okay, so I'm going to be giving the last talk of our primer session, and I'm going to be talking about our session on perceptual color quality metrics. Um, I just wanted to start out by listing the two presentations that will be in this afternoon session. Uh, the first one is on metamerism, color ellipses, and color errors. And the second one is called Delta E ITP, BT2124, is the industry ready to move on from Delta E2000? So what I'll be covering today, the fundamentals of an imaging system, then what are color differences and why should you care? And lastly, what you should look for in a color quality or difference metric. And hopefully this will give you uh, enough information to really dive deep and have some good questions once you watch the sessions this afternoon. Starting out, imaging system, some fundamentals. What do you need? Well, first you need a light source, you need a reflecting or transmitting surface, and you need an imaging device. Light source. What you need is some sort of object that's emitting light. Let's take the sun, for example. What I have on the right is a, a spectral power distribution plot. So on the bottom, we're talking about wavelength, where the shorter wavelengths are the blue colors near 380 nanometers, let's say, all the way to the right, where we have red around 780. So this is a typical daylight spectrum, where you see there's a little bit more blue light than there is red light. Now if we take a reflecting object, let's take an apple, for example. An apple would have a reflecting characteristic like the plot you see on the right. Again, we still at the bottom have that wavelength and we see that this red apple will tend to reflect more red light than it will blue or green light. That's why it appears red. It will absorb that green and blue light, reflect the red light, and that's what we would perceive. So if sunlight is now hitting that apple, the type of spectrum that you would get looks something like this, where you still have the spikiness of that daylight spectrum, 
and you have the dampening of that apple absorbing that light from daylight that was blue light. Now if we talk about an imaging device, that would be our eyes. We are the imaging device of that system. In our eyes, we have three types of cone receptors. We have the long, medium, and short wavelength cone receptors. And essentially, they, they focus in the fovea. And so that's the very central part of our vision. The peripheral has what we call um, rods. So it has a mixture of rods and cones. And rods are used for our nighttime vision. And we'll just focus on color here. So I mentioned the long, medium, and short wavelength. This is the response of our human visual system. So that long response is more in the red spectrum. So between 500 and 780 nanometers. And then the medium cone is mostly responsible for green and the short mostly responsible for blue. Essentially how our visual system works is those cones are kind of like the buckets that Pete just talked about where our medium sensor is just getting more and more information and what our brain actually sees is the integration of those. So if we're looking at that apple and our cones are absorbing the light for all of those different wavelengths, then it integrates that sensor, our sensor, and that's the signal we get. And what you may have heard of is what is called XYZ. So that is the integration of our long or medium or short, where Z is the integration of our short wavelength cones, Y is medium, and X is our long wavelength cones. So if we were looking at that apple, what we would have is more response on our red cone, a little bit on the green, and less on the blue. So what does that mean in terms of displays? So if we have the spectrum that we see on the left there, that's what we got when we had the apple and it was being viewed by the sun. But our displays, we can't reproduce that exact spectrum. We have LEDs, let's say. So we have a red, green, and blue LED that have the spectrum you see on the right. How do we make the color that you see on the left? Well, essentially we do the best we can and we try and match XYZ values. So because our human visual system, we can essentially take advantage of the limitations of our visual system by making sure to match the integration of those channels. So if we just look at this and we match the XYZ values coming out of it, we don't actually have to match the spectrum. And so that's what's called metamerism. When you have two completely different spectrum that to us appear to be the same color. And we'll hear more about that in a talk later. How do we actually then, how do we actually then go about measuring that? We have spectroradiometers. And essentially what they do is they have the human visual system model baked into the device. So inside it has a prism that splits the light and then applies that long, medium, and short wavelengths and integrates it to form our XYZ. So in reality, when we do these color difference measurements, we have a human visual system model baked into our machine. Why are colors not perfect? There's a reason we're talking about measuring color differences here. First, displays might need calibration. You might have to measure the color of one thing versus what you expect and make some sort of decision. Second, you might have image processing concerns. So you might have done some compression, you might have done some sharpening, some noise reduction, resizing. Also, your image pipeline. You might have a limited bandwidth, so you might be reducing bit depth. You might have different format conversions. There's lots of reasons why you might introduce color errors into your system. How do we actually make sure that color is accurate? Well, we could do that subjectively. You could sit someone down and make them look at images side by side, and that would be perceptually accurate. But that's pretty inconvenient that's pretty time consuming and it's pretty expensive. So what's an alternative? We could do an objective metric. So that would be automated and low cost, but is it perceptually accurate? How do we actually measure color differences? So if we're using an objective metric, what do we do about it? Well, we, I mentioned that spectroradiometer before. So if we've measured XYZ values, can we use that to objectively quantify the amount of color difference that you're seeing. 
Well, turns out we can. So if you have an XYZ of your reference, let's say you're calibrating a monitor, and you say, I am supposed to get the color yellow to be this XYZ value, and you take your spectral radiometer and you measure it and you say, actually, I get these values. How do you quantify the difference in those XYZ values? There's a number of color difference metrics that exist today. One of the most common ones is just looking at PSNR, peak signal to noise ratio. But you can also use more advanced models, such as CAE Delta E 2000 or Delta E ITP. And how all of these metrics essentially work is they take in the XYZ of your reference, they take in the XYZ of your measurement, and they spit out a number. And that number is supposed to represent how perceptually close those two colors are. When we design a color difference metric, what we want to do is make sure, let's try this one, that it matches human vision. So when I look at two TVs and I see that they don't match, my color difference metric should also say they don't match. Likewise, if I look at two TVs and say, yes, they match perfectly, my color difference metric should also say they match perfectly. What happens if they don't? Well, let's say I had two color patches, and I look at them and I say, you know what, they do not match. But my color difference metric says they do. Well, that's gonna lead to inaccuracy. So your displays won't be calibrated, you'll see differences, and that can be a problem. But likewise, on the other front too. So if I look at two patches and I say, you know, they match perfectly, and my metric says they don't, what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna keep calibrating over and over and over again to try and make those numbers perfect, even though perceptually they already look totally fine to me. So that leads to inaccuracies in the system. So you want a color difference metric that truly matches human perception. So it tells you when a color is visible or when a color is invisible difference-wise. So what I'm gonna show you is a demonstration um, showcasing the differences in a couple of different color difference metrics. So what this uh, test pattern is, is the background is just a gray field D65, and what I've done is I've taken each of those color squares and I've made them a certain amount of color difference different than the background. So essentially, I've made sure that each of these are a delta E of 2.5 different than the background in a bunch of different directions. So the black square, for example, oh, are you playing the DCP? Okay. Um, maybe we'll play this again in a second. But essentially, what I'm trying to show is the quality of color difference metrics. Thank you. So for example, the black square that you see on the left side there. What we, that's very different than all of the other squares you see on the screen. But the color difference metric is saying that it's exactly the same. So a, a color difference metric that tells you all of these are supposed to be 2.5 away from the gray, what you expect to see if it's a good quality color difference metric is that all of the patches look equidistant from that gray. Because that means it's perceptually equivalent to our eyes. And as we go up in luminance level, we expect that to also stay the same. So a good quality color difference metric would look the same at each of these different luminance levels, and all of those patches would be equidistant to each other. So now if we play the DCP, we'll start out with the Delta E 2000 metric. So Delta E 2000, what we see is that, especially that black pattern, is very different than all of the other colors you see on the screen. So that means that in those dark luminance levels, it might be a different amount of perception for each of those different colors. And as we increase in luminance level, that absolute difference starts to change as well. So essentially, the difference I see on the screen is a lot less here than it was at those low luminance levels. So that means that delta E2000 is gonna spit out lower numbers. This is delta E ITP. 
So these are supposed to be just barely discernible colors. And as we increase the luminance level, you can look at the uniformity around. And all of these test patterns should be just barely discernible. If there's any one that stands out from each other, that means it's not a good quality metric. So I just want to conclude mentioning the talks again we have today, this afternoon. Um, hopefully all of these talks gave you a good introduction to all the talks that will be going on later today. Hopefully you learned a little bit of something throughout the day. And Sarah, do you want to end it out? Okay, thank you everyone. Thank you, Jacqueline. A, a huge thanks to you for not only providing a session of your own in here, your own primer, but also curating that whole session. I found it hugely helpful. I hope all of you did too. And a huge thanks to all of our speakers, Ben, Pete, Chris, and Pierre, who had to step out. So uh, and thank you.